Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That is the sports betting podcast here on the FanDuel Podcast Network as we are inch closer and closer to week one of the NFL season, letting you know where we're looking uh, for different lines on the FanDuel Sportsbook. My name is Jim Sonnes. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Ed Fang of ThePowerRank.com. Ed, we're cruising on through here talking to Rob Pizzola about some NFL today. I am pumped for that. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm happy to change my last name if you need me to, Jim. So <laughs> Yeah, I combined uh, <laughs> your last name with the power rank. <laughs> yeah, so no, that's cool. I, I, I think rank. that that's for, from a branding perspective. Yeah. I think yeah. that that should be something you at least look into maybe. And then I sound a little less Asian, which is probably good too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm doing great. Um, um, really looking forward to talking to Rob Bazola about his process. Going to be taking a ton of notes. And uh, yeah, looking forward to another great show with you, Jim. Yeah, Rob's someone I've followed on Twitter for a while and have always enjoyed his thoughts on various things. Also, interesting life uh, going to like uh, CFL games and stuff like that. So uh, definitely a fun dude to talk to you. Follow Rob on Twitter at Rob Pozzola. Earlier this week, we talked with Whale Capper about the U.S. Open for tennis. I think Rob might do some tennis stuff, too. At least he was at a, a tennis match a couple weeks ago. So uh got a couple of tennis minds here as well. We talked about the U.S. Open with Whale Capper. We discussed different markets, how much to or how to bet and match, things to look for there, the value of the draw, which will take place pretty soon here for the U.S. Open, and people he likes for this year's Open prior to that draw. So make sure you check that out by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, Covering the Spread is available all those places as well. And while you're on Apple Podcasts, leave a rating and review. Uh, got a new one once again this week that made me chuckle. Uh, let me pull it up here. Um, they, uh, they, okay, so the, the phrasing in this was, they, or any knowledge gaps are filled by various expert guests. And I thought that was the most kind way to say Jim and Ed know nothing about tennis and decided to pawn it <laughs> off on Whale Capper. So yeah. thank you to Plantastic Life uh, for being well, very kind to us when you didn't really have to. It was, it was very nice of yeah. you. Well, I mean, we were upfront about that. I feel right. like we could have gotten slammed to be like, hey, Jim, how about, you know, how about Djokovic in this tournament? Oh, man, I've only got hey, his good. odds at 43%. Jeez, what's this <laughs> line? This is a terrible line. But yeah, I think that that's, that is kind of the goal, but I appreciate the kindness regardless. It was quite good. And if you want to leave a kind or whatever kind of review you want, just go to Apple Podcasts and search for Covering the Spread. And thank you again to Plantastic Life for being gentle to our egos. We'll get to Rob Pozzola in just one second. But first, if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit Sportsbook Book.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey or Pennsylvania. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's dive on in now and get set for 2019 NFL with Rob Pizzola. Covering the present. Let's welcome Rob Pizzola into covering the spread to talk a little bit of NFL. Rob, thank you for joining the show. I really do appreciate it. You know, busy time of year for everyone, so I appreciate you swinging by. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I mean, uh, it's a busy time of year, but it's also probably the most fun time of year leading into football season, so I'm excited to do this. And I think it's a great time to have you on because when we were talking with you before we set up this interview, you mentioned that you wanted to discuss this from a process perspective, and I think that that's kind of the this is kind of the key time to have that discussion because during the year you have to keep up with news you have to constantly be evaluating teams and stuff like that so a process-based discussion i think right now is the key time to do that now with you when are you really doing most of your research to get ready for nfl season are you starting you know in august or how do you ramp that because you're busy all year long when do you start to really get into the nfl again yeah, it's it's tough because uh, I'm I'm just a procrastinator by nature. Um, so typically, I want to get started a lot earlier than I actually do, and it turns out I usually get started late July and leading into the beginning of August. I've taken a liking to golf, uh, so I've been trying to golf as much this year, and that kind of bled into the NFL prep time. But I mean, it's sort of a a year-round process. Even though I'm not really working on it in the summer, I'm I'm sort of thinking about it. 
uh, I develop these hypotheses and start doing some testing on um, either new metrics or things that I feel are maybe not being accounted for by the market uh, that might make an impact in the following year. But I really don't ramp up the efforts until the end of July. Absolutely. Now, we've talked about projections from a player props perspective already on the show, but you know, projections matter a lot when we're talking about projections for team win totals, for Super Bowl odds, and for other markets too. There is a lot of relevance to doing projections. So when you are starting things off at the end of July, early August, what's kind of the starting point for you when you're trying to project how good a team will be in the upcoming season? Yeah, so I guess even before I get into the teams, the starting point for me um, is just looking at things that might have an impact that that aren't reflective of the team. So like rule changes, for example. Uh, how are, are rule changes in the NFL going to impact uh, the league as a whole? Uh, now, you know, I remember back to years ago when they introduced the illegal contact after five yards and penalties going up, I knew it was going to affect scoring earlier on in the year. But the market itself wasn't really accounting for that earlier in the year. So there was an edge to be had there. So I think there are certain things like that you can look out for right away, uh, looking into prior. So home field advantage, has that changed from year to year? Is a team playing in a new stadium? Uh, are they expected to have more fans in, in this season? How has that changed as a whole? So basically anything outside of the team evaluations that's going to affect the outcome of the game, that's my starting point uh, before I even look into that. Now, after that, I start getting into what I was talking about earlier. So I delve into some of these hypotheses that I have from the previous year. Uh, I actually like to make notes during the football season of things that I notice uh, to potentially research that in the off season. I don't really like to change my models in season. It's not something that I like to do, but it's something that I make a note of so that I can go back to it next year. Um, so constantly making those changes and testing for things where uh, that, that could possibly improve things that stuff I love to do. A lot of it is centered around scheduling. Um, I mean, you oft often hear people talk about, uh, I guess, the sandwich game or the trap game or the revenge game in the NFL, but they actually have no idea how to actually quantify uh, that angle or that scheduling spot or if it actually matters at all. A lot of these are just um, narratives that have been made up over the years and have been used but actually don't have an impact and something that the market doesn't account for. So. I always start off with, like I said, these rule changes, any outside factors. I move into sort of testing my hypotheses and theories to adjust my numbers. And then that's when I start getting into the team-based stuff. And to be honest, I really don't have a process for the team-based stuff. I should really do that, honestly, to come up with a checklist and make sure that I'm actually going through everything. But it's, it's just kind of like getting into it, evaluating things from a personnel perspective, looking at all the changes in the off season, who ended up where, where the were changes in the coaching staffs. And that's sort of, as I work through that, I, I start, you know, picking those things apart. So mainly personnel is the first thing I go to. And then after that, more so coaching, how a team might look different on the field, just based on um, their tendencies. What will their distribution of run pass be? Uh, what offensive formations are they likely to use? And there's some guesswork involved, no doubt about it, but that's, sort of the entire process of my off season and then preseason starts to give you a little bit of information uh on whether you're doing things correctly or not although that's also tricky as well uh, right. because you don't know if teams are actually showing their full playbook um what the motivations are there but um it's a lot of work there's a lot that goes into it and um i, I try to stay on top of it as best as i can so Rob, so kind of what you're telling me is that you're more interested in like studying the teams than say looking at what their numbers were last year in projecting 2019. Yeah, well, yes and no. I mean, it, 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 there's many ways you can model football, and I, I used to do it from a team-based perspective, and I've in recent years moved on to a player-based model. Um, so that's always going to matter, but it's it's locked down to an algorithm now. It's all mathematical. I just basically am using data on players and then I do a sort of a sanity check of all those players and all that data to make sure there's nothing that looks off to me. So essentially, does this pass the eye test um, for me? But okay. uh, because of, uh, I, I mean, because of the way that I've sort of tried to automate things as best as I can, and that's been a, just a personal goal of mine in betting as much as possible because of the time sure. constraints that I generally have, um, it, it doesn't it doesn't tie me up as much in day to day of, of going through the individual players and things along of, the, of that nature. Okay, so 
so that's really interesting. So you are doing player based stuff now in the preseason. I believe when we talked last year, you kind of had more team based things once we get into the season. Is that still true? Yeah, so essentially what I was doing is last year I was running two models in parallel, uh, a team-based okay. one and a player-based one. Um, I, I found it in every model I, I try to build. I try to build a, a nice back testing infrastructure, um, but I found that particularly hard to do with the player-based one. There was just a lot that went into it. So before I actually switched over fully to that, I wanted to give it a full season running in parallel with a team-based model. Okay. Um, and essentially what I was doing last year is just betting the edges that both models agreed on, um, right. which actually limited my volume a little bit. My volume was a little bit lower last year. Um, if I could go back, I probably would have changed that and not have done it that way. Um, but this year I'm pretty comfortable in the, the player base model. And I, I think, I just think everything's gravitating towards that. We now have enough data to, I think, properly evaluate players or at least evaluate them, uh, you know, I, I say this all the time, but we don't have to get things perfect when we're modeling sports. We just have to get things better than other people. That's the sole goal. Um, and I think at that, with the amount of data I have to work with now, and uh, I think I'm in a good spot to do that. So that's sort of why I'm switching to that that route. Well, one thing that's interesting here, and I think that something that's difficult for me as someone trying to evaluate the NFL is that every player is so context dependent, like Odell Beckham catching a pass from Eli Manning is a radically different player than Odell Beckham catching a pass from Baker Mayfield. And obviously your model is going to account for this. You know, you're not just saying, oh, he's the same person now. How do you account for those changes when you move Odell Beckham from the Giants over to the Browns and stuff like that? It's probably one of the biggest limitations that I have. Uh, okay. Because you're absolutely right. I mean, the surrounding players certainly have an impact on on everyone else. I mean, quarterback play, for example, is highly dependent on the offensive line. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of ways you can do that. You can provide each quarterback with uh, an average offensive line and regress their metrics, you know, towards an average offensive line or average wide receiver group or average offense in general. Um, but they're there are always going to be limitations with that. It's something that I struggle with in general, not only in the NFL, but just across all sports. I mean, uh, you, you see this, uh, obviously, I'm in Canada, I'm a big hockey better as well. So you see this with uh, players when they're paired with certain line mates um, and their production increases versus being paired with poor line mates and their production decreases. So um, I don't think I have that figured out by any stretch of the imagination. That's something I would like to work towards. Certainly, right. it's a goal of mine. Um, and I think that's actually one of the limitations of the way that I do things. But doing that imper imperfectly is probably better than not doing it all. And there are probably a lot of models out there that just don't account for that player usage. So I think that that's the value in the, in the player-based model is you are at least accounting for it. Even if you, you think it may not be perfect, accounting for it at all, I think, is a big plus of that model. Yeah, I would completely agree. I mean, it, you can't dismiss it. Um, be, be, yeah, for all the reasons that you just meant, I mean, that this is just a common sense, right? Natural common sense. You put a player around more talented players, they will probably perform better. Um, and, and you, you have to try to account for that in some, some fashion. Absolutely. So, so Rob, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Raiders. Uh, they're a little bit of a mystery just cause they were so bad, added a bunch of free agents. Uh, but the piece I want to ask you about is, uh, draft picks. So they had four top 40 picks in the draft and, and seven within the first four rounds. How do you deal with the influx of rookie talent? Um, okay, so how, there are a number of ways you can do it, and I've explored a number. So um, you could use player grades. For, like Pro Football Focus does college player grades. Um, there, I mean, you could use, and I'm, just, I'm not saying I'd do this or even consider it, but like I've heard of people using Madden ratings. For players that come into the league to evaluate talent yeah. um, and, and using that for purpose of their model and then sort of just uh, extrapolating the Madden ratings into some player rating that fits their system. Personally, I like to do a cluster analysis of past drafts and basically look at where players were drafted and essentially what I expect their value to be. Now, and I'm, I'm going to repeat this many times over the course of this podcast, but there's going to be imperfections in every single method. Uh, I don't think there's a perfect way to evaluate players that are coming up through the draft class and how they're going to perform in the NFL right out of the gate. Uh, I, 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 you'll start to get some information over the course of the first few weeks of the season, which you can then you know, feed into the model and slowly work to, towards getting an actual player value for them. But for me, I cluster players from the draft uh, by position and 
and where they were drafted to sort of determine what I believe their value is going to be for that rookie season. And I've done a lot of research on quarterbacks. And when researching that as it pertains to the draft, I think the biggest thing that I've seen is that NFL talent evaluators are better than perception. I think they get a hard, a bad rap because the, 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 the bust rate of NFL draft picks is pretty high. But in general, a quarterback picked first overall is going to have higher, higher probability of hitting than a quarterback picked 15th overall. So I think that, that that method, that clustering method, makes a lot of sense because, again, NFL ta- talent evaluators have their faults, but they're not that bad at what they do. And so I think that that method actually does make a lot of sense, to me personally at least. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and you are somewhat reliant on the GMs to have like some sort of, uh, I don't know, somewhat accurate draft boards, right? I mean, to, to your point, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of hit or miss with the NFL draft, but I, I've just found that to be a fairly successful uh, method. And yeah, you're certainly going to get the, you know, Patrick Mahomes of the world that just, uh, the model can't catch up quick enough to how good he actually right. is because you're using priors and things like that. And there's always going to be situations like that. But again, it's just, uh, it, the goal, again, is not to be perfect. It's just to try to get as accurate as you can with what you're working with. And with players of that skill set, you know, there's a, a many other things you can do. If you want to just evaluate the college numbers of that player, you're more than welcome to do that as well. But there's limitations with that. Like, what if they play in the Texas Tech offense where they you know the passing, or they play in the Big 12 where the defense is absolutely garbage? Uh, that's going to affect their college numbers. So it's really hard to put things into perspective when you're doing things like that. Uh, but I know people who certainly like to do it that way, right. um, not only for football, but for other sports as well. I've just chose to go with the cluster route and just um, opt to uh, think that the GMs kind of know what they're doing. So I'll just go. I'll go that way. I think that's a very fair assumption to make personally. We're talking here with Rob Pizzola. You can find him on Twitter at Rob Pizzola, P-I-Z-Z-O-L-A. Another thing besides personnel that changes each year is coaching staffs and for me, that's hard to judge because a lot of times a coach is either a, a first-time head coach or coming from a completely different situation with a different level of talent in his previous stop. So when you are adjusting teams who made off-season coaching changes, how do you kind of do that? Obviously, again, it's not going to be a perfect system, but what are the steps you take in order to project what they'll look like under that new head coach? Well, first and foremost, I mean, I, I want to see if they have priors. I mean, it's, it's easier if a coach has been in the league before, mm-hmm. um, especially if he's coached a long time in the league. Uh, an example of like Bruce Arians moving over to Tampa Bay this year. We've got a pretty big sample size on Bruce Arians and what he likes to do and how he likes to run his team. So that's a lot easier. But then you get situations like Cliff Kingsbury where uh, I have no clue. Uh, I have no kind of clue what kind of offense he's going to run. I, I, it goes back to the Texas Tech example again. But, you know, he's playing in the Big 12. It's like a run and gun type offense. That's probably not going to work in the pros. So you got to use preseason to kind of evaluate. And one thing I have to do is take some educated guesses. I mean, it's very important for me, especially the way I model the games themselves, to be able to accurately predict run pass distributions for teams. Um, and it's not an exact science by any means. And And that's where I think... Um, my love for football comes into play and just it not being work for me and being able to watch preseason and read up on news and accurately project things. Uh, It's funny because, um, and and this is like a little bit of a tangent, but I was watching um, uh, action on Showtime uh, when it it premiered a a few months ago or even further than that now. And uh, Bill Krakenberger, Crack as he's known, who was profiled in that series, was... uh, talking about not watching the games like why would I watch the games I have my bet in I beat the closing line that's my only uh my only goal as a sports better and that's fine I mean that's his opinion on things personally I find that I gain so many little things from watching the games that no model can accurately account for that or I don't want to say no model but we're not there yet Um, so little things like that, like the run pass distributions, just little nuances that you see with coaching, uh, coaches, how they fare in certain situations. And, um, to get back to the original question, it's tough. Coaching is one of the toughest things to account for in general. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that there are certain coaches that are better than others. Um, I, it's very hard for me to quantify that. 
Uh, the only thing I've been able to quantify is that there is a Bill Belichick factor in football. <laughs> the Patriots consistently outperform their metrics every single year, and that's it's come back to coaching. So uh, I actually do give the Patriots a coaching factor that goes into my model, whereas I don't give it to other teams. Um, but <laughs> if, if I told you I had the answer to how to account <laughs> for coaching in the NFL, uh, I would be lying to you. <laughs> you yeah, know don't what? Just don't you just love it when the Patriots kind of lose a couple games and then they're, you know, a little bit undervalued in the market or like Bama, like kind of slips up a little bit and they're undervalued a little bit in the market. Those, those that's, that's the best just because of those, those coaching uh, changes. So Rob, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I struggle a little bit in the preseason figuring out some of these teams that have an elite quarterback, but not much talent on the rest of the team. Um, let's, let's be specific. I'm talking about Seattle. They got Russell Wilson. I really don't like any of the talent around him i don't like how they insist on running the ball at a rate way higher than any other team in the nfl and i don't really like any of their talent on defense how would how would you account for that team in in terms of your either your models or just your study of of how good you think seattle can be yeah so there's a few teams that come to mind uh, like that where i can see a lot of talent but i'm not sure about uh the quarterback position the other way around so sure. you have your scenarios where you have seattle which is quarterback great, not filled with a lot of talent. I would almost put Green Bay in that category as well. Um, and then you have the complete opposite uh, where it's, well, this team is loaded on paper, but their their quarterback is a huge question mark. Um, the, the reality is I have a feeling of what each position is worth to each specific team based on what I think that their distribution of plays is going to be. So if a team is very pass heavy, um, their quarterback is going to be worth marginally more. It's not a, a huge amount of things, but um, it's sort of a set weight. Uh, I, I don't really want to get into how I calculate that, right. um, but I will say that for me, I mean, the quarterback is extreme. We all know the quarterback is extremely important, but my model tends to gravitate towards teams with good quarterbacks versus the opposite way around, where it's a team that is loaded on talent, but maybe not set in the quarterback position. Right. Um, I, I, I notice, I don't like want to say that. Yeah, I would say that. I mean, I, we'll get into teams that we like and we don't like, uh, you know, towards the end of the podcast, or at least teams that I like and don't like. But, um, you know, Buffalo and Chicago, to me, are fades this year, uh, which right. scares me because I look at both those teams. I especially love both the defenses. But the huge concern for me is the quarterback position on both of those teams. And if either Mitch Trubisky or Josh Allen puts it together this year, those are scary good teams. Uh, which it's funny that I would say that around Buffalo because, but I do believe that Buffalo could be really good, but I would wager more often than though, than not, those teams are not going to get enough out of the quarterback position to reach their market value or to be successful. So you're more likely to go under like, uh, you know, a team like Chicago at nine wins uh, and, and more say that, you know, Russell Wilson's worth eight and a half wins essentially. Right. Or, you know, Matt Ryan and Julio Jones are worth nine wins. Yeah, exactly. essentially. I mean, I, I think you've seen the market do that as well. I mean, not necessarily in the case of Buffalo. Buffalo's been a little bit puzzling to me because their uh, win total has actually, I think, slightly gone up since Chris first posted the original ones. But I think for the most part, Chicago's took a pretty deep dive. I think when they first opened, uh, their implied win total was around 9.4 and now it's around 8.8, .8, uh, which is very unusual to see a win total implied drop over half a win. Um, so... But yeah, I would agree with that that statement. Eh? So that all relates to trying to project teams before the season. And I think that it's a, a different beast in the NFL because obviously we don't get a large sample size, but we do need to account for what we see during the season. So for you, Rob, how quickly do you change over your thinking from, okay, this is what I had preseason to, okay, I kind of have to ignore this and just go based on what I've seen in 2019. When does that change kind of occur for you where you're leaning more on 2019 data in season versus what we saw last year and in the off season? Uh, when, at what point do I lean more on it? I think it's about halfway through the season, but I, I, from the first game of the year, I'm already incorporating that data sure. because we have that data now. So uh, basically, the way my models work is the further we get into the year, the, the less and less I'm using previous seasons. But by season's end, I'm still using the year before as well. Sure. Um, and, that you know, there, there's a constant debate about that, especially in football. Um, I think it's Rufus that always says priors matter. Uh, and he mm -hmm. always repeats that during football season. But I yeah. I agree with that. Uh, but I'm trying to bang that drum, too. <laughs> 
the problem is there's extenuating circumstances. This is why I always give myself a manual ability to override right. uh, waiting. Right. Uh, because uh, let, let Cam Newton last year, he played four games at least where he was hurt. I guarantee he was right. not anywhere close to 100%. And if I'm constantly, if that data is still feeding into my model, I'm never going to have him accurately projected if he's healthy. Now that uh, now we're getting to guessing games, uh, right. which makes it even like this guy looks hurt. Can can I trust the data on him? Can I? Um, and then there would be guys like Patrick Mahomes, where four games into the year last year, I have him. I'm still working off, you know, his first four games, which are very good. But I have his prior in my system, which is what I expect him to be coming out of of college. Um, and it's not. I mean, it's not a good quarterback. So my, I'm finding myself betting against KC every week. And I'm like, I got to stop doing this because I'm right. watching this guy play. And he's clearly he's clearly a top five quarterback in the league, even though he's only played four games. But my model thinks he's, this guy is, you know, below average. Um, and, and you got to <laughs> – that's the pro- – I'm a huge math guy. Uh, I stick with math with almost everything. But you have to be able to recognize that – this is not passing the eye test for me. Like, clearly there is something wrong here. And I'm not one of those guys that's just going to sit by and be like, wow, the, the math says this, so I'm going to go with that. <laughs> right. Because I'm betting my own money. And if I don't believe in what I'm betting, then I, I, it's, you know, it's hard. It's very difficult for me to do that when I, I know that something is, is up. So um, I slowly wait towards the, uh, the data that's coming in from this year. But I, I do go back quite a bit, not only to the last year, but the year prior as well. Uh, and I shouldn't say necessarily the year because I'm actually using right. a number of games. Um, so there'll be times where a player plays two or three games in a year or sits out an entire year. So I go back even further than that. Um, but I think that's important uh, or else you get into these very small samples um, that they can be extremely misleading. Excellent. So Rob, let's get into the fun part of the show. Uh, let's talk about teams that grab your attention for 2019, whether it be win totals, Super Bowl odds, or anything else on the betting markets? So um, I, I'm going to give you like a little interesting tidbit right off the top here. So um, I typically don't look at like the, the way I model things is much different than I used to. So typically four or five years ago, I would very much look at the previous season's uh, luck factors. Um, so the turnover margins, the uh, cl- record in close games, um, what else? Adjusted games lost for teams due to injury. Um, basically, you're trying to strip out as much luck from the previous season uh, going into the next year. Right. Uh, this is the first time I act, I did this this morning, knowing I was going to come on with you guys. So I went through all the luck factors from last year and actually compared it to the numbers that my model is producing this year uh, for regular season wins. And it's actually insane how closely they align, even though it's two different methods. Um, and I think part of that is because I'm doing this at a player at a player level. So all these teams that had significant injuries last year that are going to get guys back in the lineup, um, I'm, I'm going to see them with a higher projection this year and vice versa. Uh, I do bake in sort of like an injury factor into my, my regular season wins going into the year. But um, to me, this is not popular. I think the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are hmm. going to be, a, I mean, they're the biggest sleeper for me in the league this year. Interesting. Um, I'll get into a little bit of why. But if you take a look at their season as a whole from a year ago, obviously the turnovers were huge, uh, but I'll talk about that in a second. Adjusted games lost. I believe they had like the highest adjusted games lost due to injury in the last, it it was at least five years, but it was, uh, they lost pretty much six or seven starters on their defense at one point, um, which they're going to get back this year. Now, not a great defense, even with those starters, but an upgrade over who was playing a year ago. And then close games, they weren't very good in that metric either. But looking back to last year, the season as a whole, uh, Jameis Winston out for the first three games of the year. So Fitzpatrick is in there. Uh, Eventually, Winston comes back and he's struggling massively with turnovers. Uh, It was absolutely horrible. And then he loses his job again to Fitzpatrick, who now all of a sudden it turns into the turnover machine that we know him as from previously. (laughs) He he becomes the real Ryan Fitzpatrick. (laughs) Tons of turnovers until Winston comes back in for a second time. Now, I don't know if there was um, an emphasis placed on turnovers with him going into the latter half of the year, but he only threw two picks in his last seven games. Now, it's a small sample, and there's some luck involved there, too. I did see some dropped interceptions when I was looking at the data. 
But I think the emphasis with Bruce Arians there and, and Jameis Winston is going to be don't turn the ball over and we have a shot. And um, I think if you put them at a, at a league average turnover rate last year, they would have been a decent team. And that's even with all the injuries that they had. So now they have a full complement of weapons. The argument against it, the division, it's tough. Yeah. I mean, New Orleans, Carolina, Atlanta, the schedule's not doing them any favors. Uh, I personally see New Orleans taking a bit of a step back. That's most from Drew Brees. Uh, Atlanta, I could see getting better because of they also suffered from significant injuries on defense last year. Carolina, honestly, have no clue. Uh, my gut is that they tell they get better. My numbers tell me they're going to get better. I'm still not sold on Cam Newton being healthy going into the year. But personally, I think the Tampa Bay Buccaneers right now, uh, markets have them at roughly 6.6 implied wins. Um, I have them at 7.7. It's the biggest gap I have of any team right now going into the year. Uh, so that would be the team that I would look out for. Interesting. Do you what like their the changes? Um, like on the defensive side of the ball, they were they were really bad. I mean, I, I I can get on on I can get on board with the offense for sure, especially if Winston eliminates the turnovers. Do you just see regression to the mean on defense, or do you like some of their player uh, additions in the off season? So I I don't hate them any. I, I hate their secondary. I don't like their secondary. <laughs> uh, make that very clear. That's where they get docked the most in my model. Uh, okay. I still believe that they are going to be like a. a bad defense they're they are but they're i mean relative to last year the improvement that they will actually make on defense by being let's just say somewhere between below average and bad and not nearly like close to historically bad right. is right. enough to to make to be a significant factor okay. the turnover margin i mean i don't even know what the turnover margin is like let me see if i have it up in front of me here but it was it was insanely bad then i remember them in san francisco was just absurd, uh, the turnover margin last year. So, yeah, it's a lot of regression, but um, and by no means do I think they have a good defense, like, right. especially with the opponents they're going to play. There's going to be some high-scoring games, uh, but I think the offense is good enough, and the, the key is that the defense is not nearly as bad as it was last year. There's a big difference between historically bad and, and bad, and I think that that could be a big step up for Tampa Bay. They can just be bad, as opposed to historically bad, it's a pretty big difference. Now, let's talk about the flip side here. You talked about liking Tampa Bay. You've alluded to New Orleans, Buffalo, Chicago as teams you may not be as enthused about. Are those the teams that stand out to you on the, on the flip side here that maybe you're looking at unders or looking at other you know props of them for the full season? Yeah, so those are some that I've definitely taken unders on. I've taken an under on the LA Rams as well, which pains me because I'm actually a Sean McVay guy. Well, I was a Sean McVay guy until the Super Bowl. And then he booked <laughs> it twice from like the 40-yard line yeah. on, on fourth and one. And I was like, what's this guy doing? But, um, it, you know, the Rams are an old team. I don't think people realize how old they are. So I think a lot of it for me is age regression there, um, more, more so than anything else. Uh, Jared Goff, to me, I, I think in this – the second half of the year uh, was a much truer indicator of who he is versus the first half of the year. He, I mean, teams kind of figured out that he's sort of a one-read quarterback, and you can confuse, confuse him a little bit. He's going to make some mistakes, and they really struggle in the second half of the year to move the ball relative to the first half of the year. Uh, the O-line is worse than it was a year ago. I just don't see – you know, the Rams are still a great team, um, but – are they a double-digit win team? I'm not convinced. I think the division's better. I do like San Fran, despite what I've seen from Jimmy G in preseason so far. I'm trying not to let that seep right. into my mind, although it is there right now. I think Arizona's at least more competitive as well. Uh, Seattle, you, I mean, they, I, I never know with Seattle. I have no clue. Every year, I think this is like, I look at the talent, like you said, Ed, on paper, and they don't look like a good team, but they have an elite quarterback, and they'll make games competitive, and they'll figure it out. Yeah. But uh I think the Rams and Saints. I mean, it's funny. It was the NFC Championship game last year, and those were two teams that I loved last year. But uh, age regression, I think, will catch up to them. The Saints, tough division. Uh, but, I mean, Drew Brees is 40 now. I mean, there is clearly – his arm speed is not what it once was. I think he's slowly turning more into a check-down quarterback. He can't really make that deep throw. Or he'll still try to deep, deep throw, but he hangs it up there now. Uh, granted, he has the receivers that are able to come down with it. But those are two teams that, man, it scares me. But I did take unders on both the Saints and the Rams. Um, 
in addition to some of the other teams I talked about, Bears, Bills. I'm a Cowboys fan. I took an under on the Cowboys, which <laughs> pains me as well. But the Cowboys won five games by a field goal or less last year. Right. Um, yeah. There's actually some really good studies available online. I've done my own in the past, but anyone who wants to search um, close games the previous year and then look at those teams the following year, uh, I think after last year, I think it's 37 of 40 teams. So that's what, 92.5% that they won or lost what is considered an unsustainable amount of close games okay. uh, in a single season. And then 37 of those 40 teams actually went on. And um, what's the best way I could term this? They moved towards the more predictable um, side the following okay. year. So teams yeah, right. that ended up winning a lot of close games regressed. Uh, they, they got worse the next season and vice versa. Teams that lost a lot of close games got better the following season. There's a lot of good data to back up that theory as well. Yeah, I, I've, I've done that too, Rob. And it's that regresses very hard to 500. Your record in close games regresses hard to 500, even in college football too, which I thought there'd be a little bit more of a signal just because, you know, the di more bigger disparity in teams. Um, but yeah, that's you, you're going to see uh, record in close games go to 500 every year. That, that's one of the things. That's one of the things with the Saints too. Just looking yeah. at the Saints' schedule open in front of me here, it's it's five five games that they won by four points or less. Now, right. granted, I do think you know the Saints have an above average coach. They had, they had a great quarterback last year. Uh, th that plays a factor certainly in in close games and special teams will as well with your kicker but there's some you know luck involved in, in that as well but uh, yeah it, you, we just we see it's not consistently reproducible from year to year you look at close game records from year to year it's almost no correlation so it's uh, um, I, I think <laughs> for someone who doesn't model games and is just going into the year looking at football and says, you know what, I'm going to take uh, close games record, games lost due to injury, turnovers, uh, Pythag, make some sort of model out of that. Mm -hmm. to, I, I, <laughs> there are worse ways I can think of doing things. And uh, you, you actually do see the, it's the market really move towards those metrics as uh, you get closer to the season. That's outstanding That's stuff. Uh, that is Rob Pozzola. Once again, follow him on Twitter at Rob Pozzola. Rob, that was a fun discussion. I love having the more process-based stuff, getting to pick your brain a bit about uh, you know, how you look at things during the offseason, but also during the regular season too. And I think the player-based model is pretty fun to discuss, and I like the thought process behind it. So thank you a bunch, Rob, for swinging by. Good luck with your NFL bets in week one and beyond that, and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, guys. Covering the future. Want to give one big thank you out to Rob Pizzolo for swinging by and talking about his process for betting the NFL. Follow Rob on Twitter, at Rob Pizzola. And Ed, a lot of good insights there from Rob. And I think, I, we, I talked about this a couple of times, but I love the thought process of being player-based when it's a sport where there's as much changeover as the NFL. I just love, I love that process. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that too. And that means I need to figure that out by next preseason, you know, <laughs> for some of my own models. Um, it is uh, preseason 2019. We're already thinking 2020. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, in this business, you got to keep getting better or you get left behind. That's right. And, you know, it was really nice talking to Rob because, I mean, I've, I've almost come on the show and gone under Atlanta at nine wins. I've gone almost come on the show and gone under uh, Seattle at eight and a half wins. And part of me is like, eh. Right. They got good quarterbacks. Right. How much is that worth? And and it was, it was uh, it was really good to talk to him about that and 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 see that he kind of supported like, well, it's, that's a risky that's a risky take, you know, because they and got I, the one position, yeah. figure it and out. I like the flip side of that too, and I think it's yeah, it's difficult sometimes to separate the quarterback from a situation. I think that Mitchell Trubisky may have benefited from a positive situation last year with Chicago, and the question is, can he benefit from that again? in 2019 and I think that looking for quarterbacks who may have punched above their weight uh the previous mm -hmm. year is something that's that's interesting to me and something that yeah I try really hard to do it's hard to identify where those overperforming quarterbacks may be uh so I thought that was a really interesting discussion too absolutely and I mean you don't have to any, look any further than Blake Bortles in 2017 yeah. right uh great season for Jacksonville obviously the strength was on that defense um but that was the one NFL win total I really liked in Jacksonville under nine last year. And, I mean, you brought up, like, the Bears are kind of like Jacksonville from a year ago. I mean, yeah, that, I'm not the first person to bring that up either. I think that it's a pretty apt discussion. You had this 
really good defense paired with I don't want to say Mitchell Trubisky is a bad quarterback, but I think an unproven quarterback would be an accurate way uh, yeah. to describe him. Because like he's he could, proof. yeah, I mean he's still yeah. young, and there's still the possibility he progresses. Because especially under a guy who is as smart as as Matt Nagy, I don't want to say Trubisky is bad because that's inaccurate. He's an NFL quarterback, uh, but unproven. I think is yep. the way to phrase that. I'll talk about Atlanta in my covering the future in a second. But first, Ed, I want to hand over to you. It is week zero of college football. Got some games coming up later this week. And you want to talk about Oregon. And Oregon's yep. a team that I believe we touched on uh, with Bud Elliott. But what do you see with Oregon for this year? So Oregon got great news last year when quarterback Justin Herbert decided to come back for his senior year. He might have been the top pick in the NFL draft. And Oregon also has a boatload of starters coming back as well. And a lot of these are on the defensive side of the ball. But when I calculate my preseason model, Oregon only comes in 20th, even with all those returning starters. And the reason why is they really haven't shown the program strength over the past couple of years to be any higher. In 2018, it was their first year under Mario Cristobal. Really a roller coaster season, and they ended up 47th in my team rankings that look at margin of victory and adjust for strength of schedule. In 2017, it was the first year under Willie Taggart, and they were 49th. In 2016, uh, they were even worse. This was the last year under Mark Helfrich, and they were 73rd. So when the highest you've ranked over the last couple of years is 47th, you really need a jump to think that you're even going to get to 20th. And this is certainly possible. I mean, I definitely believe Justin Herbert is a talented quarterback. Um, he's getting a lot of NFL hype, which I think is a very important thing to consider. Um, you know, these guys are good talent evaluators. And if he's being projected as possibly the top pick, that definitely means something. And just in contrast, you know, Texas quarterback Sam Ellinger is not getting projected up there. And I think that says a lot about Texas. Um, they also have to make. They also can make a leap on defense. Uh, they were 37th when I look at adjusted yards per play from last season. They get a lot of those stars back, but they do have to replace defensive coordinator Jim Levitt, who is one of the most respected people, um, you know, as a defensive coordinator. So I really like under nine wins for Oregon, and one of the big reasons is the schedule. So they open with a semi road game against Auburn in Atlanta. They're not going to be the favorite there. Uh, Washington is going to probably be the, the the best other team in the Pac-12 North. They have to go to Washington. And they also have some pretty tough games uh, at Stanford, at USC, at Arizona State, and then against Washington State. So you're looking at six games kind of in a 50-50 toss-up range. Uh, if they take half of those, that's nine. And that's assuming that you're going to win the other games. And even with that, you're kind of expecting them to take a leap. I just don't see it. Um, the FanDuel Sportsbook, it's uh, Oregon's at eight and a half. Uh, there's definitely other places out there where you can find Oregon at nine. I think Oregon is a little bit overrated this year, and I'm going to go on under nine wins for Oregon. So I want to go back to Justin Herbert there, Ed, because I think that when looking at college stuff, I, I tend to feel most comfortable in trying to evaluate quarterbacks. And looking at Herbert, he's been very good from an efficiency perspective each of the last three years. He had an 8.4 adjusted yards per attempt in 2016. It was 10.0 in 2017, and then 8.3 in 2018. And those are really good efficiency numbers. But despite those efficiency numbers, they still graded out poorly in your model. So I think that you could say Oregon or Justin Herbert will be a good quarterback without saying that or you should bet Oregon's over. Uh, bet over their t- their total of nine wins. So right. I think that you can appreciate Justin Herbert and still be down on Oregon, given the efficiency numbers he has already had. He would need to make a major leap up in efficiency. Like if he right. were to go Kyler Murray or Baker Mayfield on the bit and have like a, a 12 adjusted yards per attempt, that's a different discussion. But that's right. also a pretty big leap up from where he has been previously. So he's already been efficient, but not efficient enough to grade out well in your models. And I think that that does matter. Yeah, I think it does, too. And, like, I mean, no one's expecting to go up into the top five this year. Um, And I don't know whether that's coaching or, or, I mean, they did lose a couple skill players as well. Um, But I don't know. I I guess I just I just don't see it. Like, I I just don't see this team making a jump this year. I think they're they're they'll be good, but they'll they'll probably be below Washington. And I think they're going to struggle to win some of those games. And those are really those are two tough 
a tough contest to have on the road or effectively on the road for the Auburn one, at least. Right. Um, and then when you kind of bake in two losses, you know, they're not certain losses, but you kind of right. bake in two losses. There's a lot of room for downward there. So I think it, it does make a lot of sense uh, to take the under there with Oregon. I think I would lean that way as well. If I were betting that total, I want to go back here to the Atlanta Falcons. I've actually talked about them already on covering the future, but I think this one actually ties into that bet. The first one we discussed with Atlanta was betting them to make the playoffs at plus 138. And part of that is because of the investments they have made on offense in the offseason. Also, regression for injuries on defense, kind of like we were talking about before. But I want to talk here about Devontae Freeman because the investments they made on offense in the offseason and injury regression for the defense should both benefit him and specifically his rushing yardage prop right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. His rushing prop number is 860.5 yards with minus 110 on both the over and the under. And I think there is a possibility that Freeman could really just obliterate that number as long as he stays somewhat healthy. And you can say that about any running back because injuries are baked into uh, rushing props for sure. But I think especially with Devontae Freeman, there is a lot of upside for him to hit the over here. Uh, the, the reasons I like this is that the Falcons invested in the offensive line in the offseason. They drafted a guard in the first round and signed two pretty competent, I would say, guards in free agency. You don't usually invest in the interior offensive line if you plan to throw 70% of the time. I do value guards when it comes to pass protection, but that does signal that they may want to run more. They also got a right tackle in the first round, and it sounds like he's going to be practicing again soon. Uh, he had a heart issue, uh, but it sounds like he'll be okay and might be able to play week one, but regardless, should not be out too long after that. And the other thing here that's a factor for Devontae Freeman's rushing total is that there's no more Tevin Coleman, and Tevin Coleman was a legitimately good player, at least I thought he was, and having him as an alternative allowed the Falcons to take a little bit of the load off of Devontae Freeman's plate. Now the backups here are Ito Smith. He struggled a bit last year. He's battling with Quadri Olison and Brian Hill for the backup job on that team. And not none of those guys really stand out to me as being in the same tier as a true player as Tevin Coleman. That may force a team to put a little bit more of a load on Freeman's side. He has gone over 865 yards rushing in every uh, each of the three years, or three of the past four years, the three years he's basically been a starter. He did miss a couple of games in 2017, still top the total there, and I think that that bodes well for him here, especially because Tevin Coleman was there for those three previous years where he topped this number. They should be a good team. They should get a large chunk of the market share, Devontae Freeman should, and they seem like they want to run a bit more this season as they move over to Dirk Cutter. Now, again, I don't value rushing, you know, numbers. Uh, I, don't, I don't want a team to be super run heavy, but if they can run efficiently and run kind of often, I think that's a good spot here for Devontae Freeman. Number of fires projections have Freeman at 991 rushing yards, which is over the total by 130 yards. That's going to be true, again, for most rushers because they're assuming health for the most point. But it does give him some wiggle room to maybe not be fully healthy for the full season. And Devontae Freeman did play earlier this preseason, which I think bodes well for what they think of his health. I am broadly into this Falcons offense and into Freeman himself, and I think he could do could hit that over of 860.5, even without being healthy the whole way through the year. So Devontae Freeman, 860.5, I think is a really favorable number. If it were closer to 900, I would probably back off pretty quickly. But 860.5, I think, is very fair, uh, given the fact that I think this team could run the ball a decent amount and run the ball efficiently. That's pretty valuable here for someone who figures to be almost a workhorse in his offense. Ed, any thoughts for you about this Falcons uh, rushing offense? And I think that you've talked broadly. We've mentioned this before. It wasn't on air, but about how when guys rack up a lot of rushing yards in an individual game, it's less about game flow, maybe more about big plays. Yeah, no, and, and that's something I talked about on my preview series that, that launched today. Um, I, I think the thing I want to bring up first is how much are they going to run the ball? Like, I've read some stuff that, that Dirk Cutter is going to run the ball more, which to me doesn't make any sense at all when you have Matt Ryan and Julio right. Jones, and they threw the ball a lot in Tampa Bay last year. So I'm right. not sure where this chatter is coming from. 
Uh, it'll be really interesting to see what their play selection is as we get into the season. And I'm also, you know, I mean, there's also been a lot of chatter about Minnesota running the ball a lot. Right. I certainly hope that's not true. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, how does this chatter translate into what they actually do? And how, you know, how can we parse that out, given a couple yeah. of games of data? Uh, I'd be really interested to see um, what happens there. Because if they do run like the Seahawks run, then I don't know. I, I don't, like, I don't think they'll do that. I hope not. I really <laughs> hope not. But I think for me, it's not about the chatter. It's more so about reacting to the investments they have made and letting them speak with their, with their pocketbooks and their draft capital and seeing right. them bring in Jamon Brown. Uh, they brought in uh, James Carpenter from the Jets uh, and also drafting uh, Caleb McGarry and Chris Lindstrom. Those are a lot of guys. I like McGarry and Lindstrom from a passing perspective too, but they're also all at least somewhat talented run blockers, especially Jamon Brown. The, the Giants numbers last year with him starting versus when he wasn't starting were incredible. So I think that those investments specifically say they could run a tiny bit more. I mm. hope they don't run as much as the Seahawks. I desperately don't want that, even though I am you know, interested in Devontae Freeman's rushing prop. Right. I just think that reading those investments, reading where they put their draft capital and, and their, their money, that signals to me a little bit more run heavy this year than they have been. Yeah, that'll be interesting. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. That's what makes you know this, this first three weeks is is going to be well. First, however many weeks, right? It's gonna be really and we're going to learn a lot in yep. those couple of weeks. So I think it's uh, it's going to be fun. Rob talked about that. How once we had that first week of data, you want to account for it because it is data that we did not have previously. So uh, should be interesting yep. to see how things go here for the Falcons in 2019. They're a team that I really do like. Pretty interesting amount. It is week zero, Ed, of college football. We're going to get into our regular season schedule, not next week, but the week after that. We will have a college football week one preview next week on Thursday. We're doing a college football and NFL preview broadly on Monday, just going through what our numbers say about both the NFL and college football, picking out some of our favorite bets for the year, just giving you one big preview episode to get you set for 2019. But uh, we got Florida versus Miami coming up on Saturday. Florida is favored by seven and a half. Total there is 47 for Jaron Williams' debut. And then Arizona against Hawaii. Two fun quarterbacks here. Khalil Tate against Cole McDonald, who is awesome because, hey, he's he's a good quarterback. He gets a ton of volume. Like, his, his passing volume is high, and that's why people talk about him. But he's also decently efficient and... It sounds like Ole McDonald, which I think is pretty valuable. I'm probably the 10,000th person to point that out. But Cole McDonald, Khalil Tate, I'm pumped for that. Uh, what are you are you looking out for anything uh, in this first week of college football? Yeah, I'm looking to see if Florida's for real. Because if they are, I think they should win somewhat handily, even though Miami has a pretty good defense. Uh, how's the freshman at quarterback going to play yeah. for Miami? And, man, Cole McDonald last year, his first four games, his passing numbers were – ridiculous yeah before they finally regressed a little bit yeah. um but that'll be just a fun late night shootout i think yeah i mean i love games like that where it's gonna be a huge total like i have not looked into the either of those games enough to bet them but like from a college football fan perspective i'm pretty jacked up to see what happens there so i think that'll be a fun Sorry. slate and again we'll get a full preview of week one and next week on thursday make sure you subscribe to covering the spread to get that preview right as it goes up you can find covering the spread on spotify apple podcasts uh, stitcher the google play store wherever you get your podcasts you can find covering the spread and again ratings and reviews are oh so greatly appreciated ed I know you got your big previews going up over at the Football Analytics Show. Uh, what else you got going on for the rest of the week? Yeah, well, the episode I posted today was the secret about 100-yard rushers in the NFL. Yeah. And this was particularly interesting to me because I had a hypothesis that 100-yard rushers racked up most of their yards at the end of the game when their team was up. Right. Uh, and that turns out to be not true. So a little <laughs> bit embarrassing from that perspective. Uh, if you're interested in fantasy or daily fantasy, I definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, I think there's some interesting insights there. And then also it was interesting for me, Jim, because it was a 10-minute audio episode. And this was one that I wanted to have a written version of it as well, just so people come okay. and, and check it out. And it ended up being 1,500 words. Okay. And that's that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it just made me be like, man, uh, yeah, that was a lot of work putting together 10 episodes right? of which eight done and nine will be done by the end of the week but i would find yeah, it pretty depressing to know how many words i have spoken 
over the past year. And I really would not, I would desperately not want to know what that number was. Well, or maybe it's very enlightening with just the work that you you put that's, out for FanDuel number fire. That's true. You maybe know? it'd be good for performance reviews. Uh, so yeah. we'll, we'll check into that. But just for my own sanity, I'd really rather not know. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, when you, when you kind of think back about it, you know, you never... I guess I kind of knew what I was getting into because I had yeah. done this for March Madness, but right. um, that was an interesting kind of wake up call. But like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, so it it's should a be lot good. Of I, I think it's interesting. Yeah. We end, I ended up talking about green, you know, kind of from a fantasy perspective, which I don't really do, yeah. but talk a little bit about Green Bay, talk a little bit about the New York Jets cool. as well. Looking forward to that. You can find uh, the written version of the Power Rank, I assume. Yeah, the written and the audio version are both up. I'm still okay. hoping to get a retweet from Jim Sonis at some point today. <laughs> so. I'm going to ask him about that, you know, when we get off the air. Works for me. I will happily retweet at the Power Rank whenever I need to. That's where you can find Ed Fang on Twitter, at the Power Rank. And again, the podcast is the Football Analytics Show. Find that wherever you get your podcasts. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald for keeping us on the air for today. Thank you, as always, Cal, for chopping up these videos, putting it up on YouTube as well. You can find all of the cover or covering the spread up there. And thank you to those of you who tuned in for this week. Next week, Monday and Thursday, getting you set for the college football season. And, of course, more NFL talk. Should be a whole lot of fun. We'll talk to you then. This has been Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs> <laughs>